Okay, so uh, you've uh, seen this picture uh, two or three times uh, already, and uh, as we heard very eloquently from, uh, from Guido just now, this is going to give us exploration of the 10 TV scale, not just directly with proton protons, but also indirectly with uh, E plus E minus. Uh, we also heard rather a lot this afternoon about hadron hadron already, and uh, I promise you that I think that's the last mention that I make of FCC HH. So, uh, Ricardo uh, in his introductory talked about, uh, talked about the uh, little hierarchy problem, uh, which I refer to as the Sherlock Holmes problem, uh, which is what happened to all those dogs that did not bark? Uh, I don't know if anybody here is a fan of Sherlock Holmes, but there's a famous story called The Silver Blaze, in which uh, Sherlock Holmes is asked, you know, what's the important clue? And uh, the important clue is the dogs that, the incidence of the dog in the night time, but the dog did nothing in the night time. That was a curious incident. So I, I think that if we were as clever as Sherlock Holmes, we would you know, figure out why it is and what there is besides the Higgs boson. But I agree with Ricardo that so far we seem to be too stupid to do that. Now, uh, there's a school of thought that says, well, uh, the standard model is complete with the discovery of A, perhaps even the Higgs boson, and uh, so there may be no beyond the standard model physics. So I would like to remind you that similarly hubristic mispredictions have been made in the past. Uh, Michelson said the important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered uh, three years before the discovery of the electron and the start of particle physics. Uh, Lord Kelvin said in 1900 there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now, uh, five years before the discovery of the second elementary particle, the photon. Uh, Stephen Hawking said in 1980 is the end in sight for theoretical physics. And uh, driving here this morning, uh, I was reminded of Christopher Columbus. Uh, so uh, he got a rather negative uh, reaction to a grant proposal back before 1492. Uh, so many centuries, sorry, years after the discovery of the Higgs boson, it is unlikely that anyone could find hitherto unknown particles of any value. <laughs> so, uh, why am I so convinced that there is actually physics beyond the standard model? And uh, my basic text is taken from that immortal scientist, uh, James Bond. And I take as my motto, the standard model is not enough. And uh, in uh, deference to James Bond, I give you 007 reasons for expecting physics beyond the standard model. One of them is that uh, empty space is unstable. Uh, there's dark matter, which has been mentioned a few times. The origin of matter, that's also been mentioned a few times. Neutrino masses, also been mentioned. The hierarchy problem, Ricardo certainly gave a lot of time to that. And then I've got a couple of other ones, which I don't think have been mentioned so far, uh, cosmological inflation and quantum gravity. I could go on and on, but I think that's already enough to give you the general picture. So those who know me well will not be surprised when I say that uh, Susie is the answer to uh, almost all of these, uh, well, not, not the answer, it mitigates no, not perfect, no, no. We don't want them to be perfect, Guido, do we? We always want something else besides, right? So in the following, I will finish up with uh, a little bit of uh, discussion of Susie in the framework of uh, FCCEE. But before that, I go through a more general discussion. Okay, so... Uh, this is a plot that has gone through uh, various uh, iterations. Uh, this particular iteration, I think I took from a, a talk by uh, Patrick. So it shows you the uh, center of mass energies of various proposed E plus E minus colliders, the luminosity on the vertical axis. So uh, you pay your money, you take your choice. So you might decide to go for the ILC, in which case 
uh, I would say, you're relatively limited in luminosity and you're also relatively limited in energy. You might go for CEPC, in which case you're also very limited in luminosity. Or you might go for CLIC, which would be the way to go if, for example, uh, or could be the way to go if, for example, the LHC discovers supersymmetry uh, later on this year. Or you go for FCCEE, which over the energy range that it covers gives you unparalleled luminosity. And, uh, okay, I don't think anybody here doubts that uh, this is the machine to go for if indeed there is no obvious new threshold uh, discovered in the LHC in the near future. So, uh, I'd just like to remind you that uh, we had this first look at FCC EE uh, physics study. Of course, that was back in the days when it wasn't called FCC EE, it was called TLEP. Uh, the name changes, but the physics doesn't change. And uh, here I've got a list of the uh, various uh, topics there, uh, precision measurements, uh, uh, well, I come back to these precision measurements in the moment. So since uh, there may be people here who have not been uh, fully exposed to FCEE physics studies up to now, uh, I thought I'd just mention on a couple of slides uh, the people who are responsible for the various different uh, FCCEE working groups, uh, both experimental and theoretical. And uh, of course, many of the people are, uh, are here uh, Roberto, Marcus, Patrizia, uh, lots of people are here. Ariella, Gigi, etc. Uh, over on the theory side, here is a, a list of uh, the theoretical working groups and uh, the people who are responsible for coordinating them. Uh, I would note that uh, a couple of these are actually jointly with uh, the experimental working groups. Oh, one working group that I would like to mention in particular is that on uh, precision electroweak calculations. And I wanted to highlight the fact uh, in the course of my talk that we really desperately need those uh, next generation or next to next to generation uh, electroweak calculations to really extract full value from FCEE measurements. So, uh, when one is thinking in a very general way about uh, SCEE physics, uh, there are two frontiers that come to mind. So, uh, one is precision measurements, uh, Z, W, H, and so on. And uh, it's specifically in these precision measurements, of course, that these uh, higher order calculations come to be particularly necessary. There's also a whole range of other topics which have to do with rare decays. Uh, and here, there's many opportunities. Uh, 10 to the 13 Zs, 10 to the 12 Bs, Cs, and Taus, 10 to the 8 Ws, uh, 10 to the 6 Higgses, and Tops. And uh, of course, in contrast, I said I wasn't going to mention FCC HH again. I'm just going to mention it again. In contrast to FCC HH, these are all produced in extremely clean conditions so that you really can access uh, very rare decays of these objects and uh, measure these things very precisely. So I'm afraid that in my talk, I'm not going to do uh, justice to these uh, rare decays. Uh, some of them will be discussed uh, in more detail in later talks and are going to be more focusing on these precision measurements. So th this is a, a slide which, uh, to my mind, shows on the one hand the potential power and also the, uh, the outstanding issues with regard to these precision measurements. So on the left, we've got precision electroweak measurements, uh, Z physics, W physics, and so on. On the right, we've got precision uh, Higgs physics. Uh, let me just look at this for a moment. So th these sort of horizontal colored bars here are the uh, accuracies that you might get from uh, various future accelerators, LHC, high luminosity LHC, ILC, and so on. 
But notice also this uh, horizontal green bar. This is the uh, current standard model uncertainty as quoted by the Higgs cross-section working group. Now, there are some people who think that the Higgs cross-section working group is being uh, unnecessarily conservative, but you know, that is the state of play at the present time. I will also draw your attention to these little symbols over here. These are the, the deviations from the standard model prediction for the corresponding uh, Higgs decay. Uh, the deviations from the standard model prediction that you find in various simple, probably oversimplified supersymmetric scenarios. Uh, so if you look at that, you would immediately say, I think that TLAP, aka FCCEE, is the only one that stands a chance of distinguishing by indirect measurements supersymmetry from the standard model. But again, it only stands that chance if you can control the theoretical uncertainties. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go in great detail through the uh, experimental uh, measurements. Uh, here I just have some plots that again I stole from Patrick which uh, highlight uh, three of the uh, precision physics opportunities with FCCEE. On the left, we've got the Z peak. Here, we've got the W threshold. On the right, we've got the top threshold. So with those, you could, for example, maybe measure the width of the Z to 10 keV. You could measure the mass of the W to 500 keV. And you could measure the mass the top to 10 MeV, if you can make sense of it in the context of uh, perturbative QCD. I, I don't think I need to tell anybody who is a, a veteran of LEP that if you want theoretical calculations to be at the level of those experimental measurements, you're going to need a, a new generation of uh, precision electroweak and, of course, also QCD calculations. Okay, so here is a, a more complete uh, list of uh, interesting precision measurements that you can make with uh, FCCEE. So I've already highlighted uh, M top, gamma Z, and uh, MW, not for any particularly strong reason, but it just happened to be the ones that, I, that caught my attention. And uh, here on the right-hand side, you've got uh, some of the, the challenges in actually... Um, uh, matching the perspective experimental position. I have a question, yes, Tor. For a measurement of MZ and gamma Z at the precision which you hope for, are you sure that QED is the only challenge and not also the two loop electroweak calculation? Uh, no, I actually think that, that you probably need at least two weeks two-loop electroweak calculations. Yeah. So, uh, I took this from Patrick, so maybe Patrick would like to defend. <laughs> <You took it>? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we could spend the afternoon going around the room to find out. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Alain says that looking at this table, you have to compare the possible statistical error with the possible systematic error that comes from a best guess. Okay, well, well of course, what I was saying was exactly complementary to that. What I was saying was that, as a theorist, you know, I'm interested in the challenges over here of the higher order calculations. Yes, well, that's what I'm going to do now, right. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to discuss what, what you could prospectively get from those measurements, and I'm going to do it first in as model-independent a way as possible, and secondly, as, as model-dependent a way as possible, just to have two complementary approaches. So 
The first one is the most model independent approach, and that is this uh, description in terms of an effective field theory with higher dimensional operators, which you think might be uh, relics of higher energy physics, uh, something which Ricardo was a, a pioneer of over a decade ago. So th this business, as in fact Ricardo has already mentioned, is, is pretty complicated. Uh, so here is a, a partial list of such operators which you find under certain uh, restrictive assumptions. Uh, the name of the game is to constrain the coefficients of these operators with a combination of measurements, as precision electroweak measurements, Higgs data, uh, triple gauge couplings, etc., etc., etc. I think the beauty of this approach is that you can actually tie together and see the synergies between these various different measurements. So let me just give you uh, a first example, which is uh, electroweak uh, precision observables. So these are uh, perhaps the most important operators contributing to these. And uh, this is... Uh, taken from uh, a paper that I wrote with Veronica Sands and my student uh, Tuvong Yu uh, towards the end of last year. And this shows you the uh, current limits on this coming mainly from, uh, from LEP measurements. Uh, the little green arrow bars are if you treat each operator independently and uh, the red comes from doing a, a global fit. This is what happens when you do the same thing with those prospective FCC EE data that we saw uh, on, the previous, uh, on the previous slide. You see here uh, the standard model at zero, and you see these little tram lines, uh, little dash lines on either side. Uh, Excuse me, John. When you say each operator independent, you mean all the others are at zero? Yes. And, okay, thank you. So, so these dashed lines are the same dashed lines as on the previous slide. Uh, the fact that they got so much wider apart is just telling you how much better FCC EE does for you. So uh, on the top here, you give the sensitivity to uh, lambda prime, which is some sort of measure of the new physics scale. And you see you're talking about uh, tens of TeV, respectively, with FCEE. So of course, we're, we're we hope that we will not see a result centered on zero, right? Uh, but you know, this at least tells you the sensitivity when there's this particularly uh, model independent framework. Uh, okay, so this is perhaps, yes, this is, so this is now going on to uh, Higgs measurements. So it, it's well known uh, that FCC EE gives you the most precise measurements of Higgs couplings. And uh, here is a direct comparison between FCC EE, uh, ILC, and uh, high luminosity LHC. So what do those precision Higgs measurements bring, you to, the bring to the table? So uh, these are quantitatively the uh, uncertainties. Uh, again, I would like to re-emphasize the fact that we're going to need to improve our theoretical calculations in order to match these prospective experimental uncertainties. I already made that point in connection with uh, Higgs branching ratios. So this is where we are now with uh, Higgs coupling measurements. So uh, this uh, red line here shows you the expected linear dependence of Higgs couplings uh, with a mass. We've already seen a variant of this plot uh, earlier on. Uh, the dashed line with the two dotted lines, that's the current plus or minus one sigma uh, excursion from an analysis that uh, Tivong Yu and I did uh, using the simple uh, two-parameter uh, description of the data. And uh, in case you're wondering about the duck, uh, <laughs> when we first did this, we wrote in our paper that uh, this particle walks and quacks like a Higgs boson. So this is what you could do with FCC EE. Uh, so if you look very, very hard here, you can see some experimental uncertainties. So, 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 
So, so this is just with the, the quote-unquote standard set of measurements. But th there are other measurements which prospectively FCC EE could make, and I think we'll be hearing more about at least some of these uh, later on in this uh, workshop. Uh, one is the possibility of measuring first-generation quark couplings of the Higgs boson uh, through the decays uh, Higgs into rho gamma and the like. And another very exciting possibility, which is you know, almost, for me, too exciting to contemplate, is the possibility of actually measuring the Higgs goes to E plus E minus coupling. And uh, I remember thinking about this in 1975 together with Mary Gaillard, and we said, shit, this is never going to be observable, right? It's 10 to the minus 10 or 11 or something of the Z peak. But with FCC -E -E, it is within a factor of a few of being measurable. And uh, maybe with a little bit more effort, we could reduce that factor of a few down to one. So, so the previous slide tells you that uh, you know, the Higgs coupling to other particles is uh, incredibly boring so far. But I would like to remind people that there is one interesting measurement from CMS that merits following up, and that is uh, flavor-changing Higgs couplings. So uh, CMS set out to look for Higgs goes to mu tau, and they found it not with enormous significance. You know, if they hadn't found any 2.5 sigma effects, then we knew that they were cheating. But you know, this is just a reminder that there is space already in the LHC data for a, a really standard model breaking result. And uh, we certainly look forward to hearing more from CMS and more from Atlas about this in the future. But I think this just highlights the fact that you know, in addition to the precision physics, which I'm talking about mainly in this talk, there's also opportunities in, in rare decays. Okay, so now I come back to this uh, effective uh, field theory approach and uh, return to this paper that I wrote with uh, Veronica and uh, Tivong. Uh, now I'm looking at the coefficients on uh, operators that you get using Higgs information. So again, the, the green are single operator fits and uh, the black are the, a global fit. So this includes Hignell strengths and uh, uh, vector boson plus Higgs kinematics in a uh, global fit. Uh, again, you've got, sorry, you've got tram lines here. Uh, notice here the great difference in scale. Right? Here we're talking about probing physics at the level of a TeV whereas uh, we had much higher precision previously when we're talking about the precision electric weak data. That's, of course, because you know, we've got a sample of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 Zs, and we've got a, a much smaller sample of analyzable Higgses. Uh, as I already commented, in addition to uh, Higgs production, also triple gauge couplings can be used synergistically to constrain uh, these higher dimensional operators. And uh, so their effect here is shown in red. Now the Higgs production data is in blue. Uh, and uh, global combination is in black. OK, so now I've got my tram lines. I've got the current LHC constraints. And this is the corresponding FCC EE perspective constraints. So again, I played the trick of having these little tram lines, which then expand to show you the improvements that you get with FCC EE. The scale here is significantly better than what it was before, obviously, but it is still not at the level of tens of TV that you are with the precision electroweak observables at the Z peak. So this, I think, highlights the fact that those 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Zs give you really unparalleled uh, ways of probing new physics. Uh, one of the reproaches of uh, FCC EE, just to finish off the Higgs story, is uh, the fact that you don't get a direct measurement of the triple Higgs coupling. 
And I just wanted to remind you about uh, work by uh, McCulloch in particular, where he has been discussing the sensitivity through radiative, radiative corrections to the triple Higgs coupling. So, uh, what I've described up to now has been, as I said, as model independent as what one can be. Uh, of course, there are lots of models, and many of them attempt to address the hierarchy problem. Uh, they can't all be right, they could all be wrong. And uh, in this connection, I'd like to quote this uh, cartoon from the First World War, where uh, there were these two theorists who are being bombarded by negative experimental data concerning their favorite theory. And uh, one of these theorists is saying to the other one, if you know of a better theory, go to it. Well, there's, there's lots of theories there, but I personally don't know of any better theory than supersymmetry. So that's what I'm going to be spending the remaining few minutes of my talk discussing. So I, I would actually you know, argue that relative to other ideas for physics beyond the standard model, the case for supersymmetry has been strengthened by LHC 1.1. Notice I said relative to other beyond the standard model theories. Right? <laughs> because uh, with the current measurements of M top and M Higgs, it seems that we need something to stabilize the electroweak vacuum, which supersymmetry does for you. Supersymmetry predicted successfully the Higgs mass. Supersymmetry predicted successfully that the couplings of the Higgs would be very similar to those in the standard model. And those are all reasons in addition to all the traditional reasons, naturalness, gut, string, dark matter, and so on and so forth. So, so, so let me just remind you a little bit about the instability of the electroweak vacuum. Uh, and I slipped this in because somewhere this afternoon, I think it was Guido said, uh, you know, the standard model can be extrapolated up to the Planck scale. Uh, not so, not so. Well, may, or at least maybe not so. So I just remind you what the issue here is. The issue is that uh, the Higgs self-coupling is renormalized, you know, just like any other coupling. Uh, it would renormalize itself in the direction of increasing as you go to higher scales. But with the measured values of M top and M Higgs, the dominant renormalization actually has the opposite sign. It's a reduction in the Higgs self-coupling due to the top quark. And uh, if you take uh, the best calculation available of this renormalization by de Grassi et al., and if you stick in the current best fit values of M Higgs and M top, you find that this instability sets in w way below the Planck scale. <coughs> now, this argument should be taken with a pinch of salt. First of all, that error is certainly not Gaussian. Uh, secondly, you know, probably the theoretical calculations have a larger uncertainty than is actually quoted. Uh, the determination of M Higgs that goes into this is probably good enough, but the determination of M top certainly requires improvement, uh, both theoretically and experimentally. And uh, this, I think, will be one of the sort of bread and butter tasks of uh, LHC 1 2 to try to uh, pin down the uncertainty in M top. Anyway, this prospective vacuum instability for me says that there has to be some new physics that comes in before that scale. And what else, what better than uh, supersymmetry? Well, uh, so just one small problem, no sign yet of supersymmetry. And uh, this is uh, a plot, the horizontal axis is the uh, scalar mass, the vertical axis is the fermion mass. In uh, the simplest possible, oversimplified, undoubtedly, uh, variant of the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. 
And uh, this is subject to all sorts of constraints. Uh, BS goes to mu plus mu minus, dark matter, LHC. The end result of all this is that if you look, for example, at the possible mass of uh, a squawk, then you find that there are two possible regions corresponding to the two red regions in this plane here. Uh, one at quote unquote relatively low masses, less than about 3 TV, and one at relatively high masses, above 3 TV. And the LHC with high luminosity uh, will be able to tell us whether, for example, the low mass uh, option is the right one or not. Okay, so that's the, the, super, the, the simplest possible supersymmetric framework. So, so what do precision data tell us? Actually, not a hell of a lot. So, so this is the impact of uh, LEP precision measurement. Uh, this is actually gamma Z, but I could have chosen any of a number of others. Uh, this is all green because everywhere in this allowed region of this particular model parameter space, uh, you are within one sigma of the standard model value. So, so this particular measurement is not going to help you uh, determine whether or not you've got supersymmetry, still less the measure of supersymmetric model parameters. You're always within one sigma. This is the corresponding measurement at FCC EE. So uh, yellow is between one and two sigma, red is between two and three sigma. If it's not colored, that's because it's beyond three sigma. And you notice that there's only a very small region here where you're anywhere close to uh, the measurement. So what I've done here is taken the same central value as today. So, sorry, I've taken the central value which is predicted by supersymmetry at this point here in the middle of this spot, and I've put in the SCC EE error bar. And this is the same thing for MW. And Are the points consistent with the direct now? Consistent with? I mean, those points, if I understood, are they consistent with direct searches now? Yes. Right. So, so, probably I went a little bit too quickly. So, <laughs> If I take all the present constraints, okay, then I've got a 95% confidence level region in blue and a 68% confidence level region in red in this particular simplified model. And I take the best fit point, which happens to sit in the middle of this little red blob here, and then I uh, assume a measurement with that value, okay, and then I look to see what other points are within one, two, or three sigma. And now if I do a, a global fit to the FCC EE precision measurements, I get the best fit point, okay? And these ellipses at the 68 and 95% confidence level. I can do the same thing with Higgs's. So again, at, at the present time, the Higgs measurements are, all, are within one sigma. But if I go to the possible future measurements, uh, again, we've got these different red, green, and yellow colors. And if I put them all together, again, I get a little error ellipse centered around the best fit point. So this is telling you that indeed, FCC EE could be sensitive to this particular type of supersymmetric model, uh, both in the Z measurements and also in the Higgs measurements independently. I wasn't going to show it to you. I've got it in there if you want to see it. You, you don't want to tell us, right? Well, uh, what do you want to know about the spectrum? I mean, no, 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 no. So typical masses are about 2 TV. Okay, T typical strongly interacting particle masses are about 2 TV. But I think the next slide may be answering, about to answer the question that you were going to ask. So, that best fit point is actually accessible to the LHC because it sits in this red region over here and that corresponds to a range of squark and gluino masses which are accessible with uh, LHC, well, even with LHC 1-2 actually, certainly with high luminosity LHC. 
So this is what you would get with uh, measurements at high luminosity LHC. So these are a relatively crude estimate of the accuracy that you would get in the Gluino and Squark masses, translated into this M0, M1 half plane, and then overlaid. Okay. And this is a combination of the information. So what this is telling you is that if you see supersymmetry at LHC 1, 2, 3, high luminosity, then FCC EE will enable you to do a quantum test of supersymmetry at the loop level. So that's just one example in, in a very specific uh, model context. Okay, so that brings me to the, the end of my talk. Uh, Edmund Burke said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And lots of people have gone on to comment, and maybe also those who do know history. So uh, we had a lot of fun over many decades with uh, LEP, Precision Z studies, W physics, Higgses, etc. Uh, well, we didn't find the Higgs or anything else, but we did do some very nice Z and W physics. Uh, the LHC, well, that's had more luck with the Higgs, but not so much luck so far with anything else. In just the same way as LEP and the LHC have given us 50 years of interesting physics, I'm sure that FCC, EE and HH together could give us another 50 years of interesting physics. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Questions? David. So, do you have an, uh, an estimation of the uh, reduction in the theoretical uncertainties that can be expected, uh, I don't know, in 10, 20 years, in order to cope with the uh, experimental un expected uncertainties? Because, you, I mean, you, all the tables you show are those that are provided by experimentalists, but it would be at least uh, interesting to try to guess uh, how much the corresponding theoretical uncertainties would be reduced. Yeah, well, these obviously depend on the observable that you're interested in, and this is the topic of a longer discussion. And at one of the uh, earlier FCC EE workshops, in fact, we had a talk by Hans Kuhn precisely on this subject. Uh, but just to give you an example, I mean, Todd, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the current uncertainty in calculating the W mass for fixed values of the standard model parameters is a, a few MeV. <laughs> My 4 MeV, something like that, yeah. Uh, so here we're talking about a measurement which is perhaps a factor of 10 better than that. Just one example. Uh, if, you, if you're asking about uh, Higgs physics, uh, you saw those very broad error bars. So, sorry, not er you saw those very broad theoretical uncertainties. Sorry? Uh, can you show the plot again? I mean, this this was for uh, I, I understood those were theoretical uncertainties at the LHC. No, it's not an e plus e plus or minus machine. No. Okay. Yeah, the, so, the, but the, it's, alpha, the... it's mostly alpha s then, and alpha s is known to uh, 0. 0.7 percent, 0. 0.6 percent. So so, 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 so these these uncertainties are dominated by uh, yeah the, the by, by, by QCD. Yeah, QCD, but... Uh... So, the, so, so there's several aspects to that. One is what is, for example, the right value of MB. Uh, the, the other one is how do you do the appropriate next to next to next to next to next to next to whatever it is, le uh, leading order QCD calculations. But you mentioned this Higgs working group, so this is LHC working group. This is a, this is a hadronic machine, this is not a... Uh, Yeah, 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 but they've got a whole, you know, tome on uh, recommendations for the Higgs properties, not just the production, but the, the Higgs properties. Uh, in fact, some people would argue that 
they're actually very conservative there, for example, in the, in the value of MB that they put in. What are the uncertainties in the value of MB? But concerning those precisions, I think it's uh, certainly the uh, it's good for us to uh, ask the theorists to do the all electronic calculation at three loops or the QCD at next power four leading order calculations. There, I think there's a uh, creative exercise to do to try to see if those. Uh, uncertainties such as the B mass or the alpha QED at the Z pole couldn't be extracted from the data. It was sent to 11 BB bar pairs. I remember people had extracted a value of the B mass from the properties of gluon emission uh, at the, uh, in BB bar events, for instance, or can we measure alpha QED? Uh, from the data themselves by looking at uh, uh, mu mu gamma events and such things. So I think there's a lot of um, inventiveness to be had in trying to corner those things by data uh, to help the tourists a little bit. Simple question. I, I simply want to be sure. The fact that you refuse to speak of, uh, that, not refuse, you didn't speak of F FCC HAH, right? Does not mean, I suppose, that you don't see that machine as preliminary to FCC HAH, right or wrong? No, of course. No, no, the, the whole point of the last slide was to say that I actually see it as a, a combined package, which much like uh, FCC, sorry, Le LEP and LHC, uh, you know, gave us, or is giving us, 50 years of exciting physics. I, I, you know, I, I certainly agree that EE and HH together make a package. I, I was asked to talk about EE, so I did. You're referring to swap the time scale or to the fact that in that slide there was no uh, branching ratio computed at well, HH? At some point he said that Yeah. 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 So is the order for lepton and hadrons, is that decided formally in any way? Maybe this is a stupid question. Absolutely not. And it might be HH and any -E or... You know, you know, this is beginning to shape up into the general discussion that there was supposed to be. Uh, yeah, okay, but not... Uh, so... I mean, you need a larger audience than here to discuss this question, number one. Number two, it's... Uh, the EE machine is a simpler machine than the HH machine, so it's... For example, you know... Cuts the discussion. Well, not, not just a simpler machine, but a, a cheaper machine. A cheaper, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean... Just one point this, if I can. As I said, it seems to me that this machine, I feel pretty sure to say that this is the machine that we need for the future already now, right? Same. On the contrary, the ordering might depend quite a lot on what you see at, at LHC 14, right? No? Yeah, yeah so, so whenever I'm giving a, a less telegraphic talk about this sort of thing, I always say that it, you know, it's premature to reach any sort of decision until we've seen what LHC run to uh, produces. Yes, but I dare say that already now you can say that this is a machine. Well, I can already say this is an exciting machine. Now, uh, whether it is the top priority machine or a second priority machine, you know, that I think we have to wait for LHC 14. It doesn't cost much, so we can. But I feel, <laughs> I feel that I can make the state signal, which is myself. But that's okay. We need, we need to speak inside the microphone. So once at, at a time, and uh, I mean, these are very nice discussions, but I think no. that the audience is too small for these discussions. No, no, but, but, but I, I thought that the program had 
No, a half hour discussion period scheduled, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now. <laughs> Actually, it's now. Yeah. <laughs> After you. Uh, are there any other questions to John? So let's thank John again.